in, in terms of like Seven Dust, mm -hmm. like yeah. So when I first joined, they they were drinking on a different level, and like still, they're drinking more than you. Yeah. So <laughs> I loved it. I, I I joined right into that culture, and uh, I had a lot of fear when I jumped ship to that band. So what I naturally did at that point in my life, when I was in fear, uncomfortable situations, I would drink drink my way through it uh that was the first time that i actually consciously leaned on that to to deal with my emotions mm -hmm. and um that was the, I, the first time i noticed that and so and how long you been with seven dust 30 years wow. man. 30 years like that's wow. crazy to 30 us. years with seven dust yeah wow that's crazy it is i didn't know man. that and then you also were with corn yeah 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 they, the guitars yeah it was a great man mm -hmm. corn man I, I i kind of give them a little credit for like saving my life man and my last run with alcohol mm -hmm. was with those guys and i was kind of trying to fix mm -hmm. my life and and unfortunately my experience with them was when mm -hmm. i was in that turmoil welcome to the hell has an exit podcast with host teddy tarantino new episodes every tuesday at 4 p.m eastern don't forget to subscribe Hey guys, welcome to Hell Has an Exit. I'm your host, Brian. If you do watch the show and you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe, send it to a friend, leave a comment, uh, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, whatever you can do to help the show, um, you know, reach more people is definitely gonna help out. So I appreciate that. Today we have a special guest. I'm so excited that you're here. Clint Lowry, that's yeah. your last name. Okay. I was originally going to go to Orlando, and you just happened to be doing a show, and I appreciate you making up for a uh, you know quick time and yeah, pleasure to have you, man. Of course, I'm happy to be here, and I, I was actually looking at the schedule and saw it lined up to to come to your home and and do it on your territory, which I think is great. You I know? appreciate I'd like that. To keep it keep it easy for you, you know. Yeah, man. So. You've been clean 16 years? You just celebrated 16? Yeah, That's yeah, amazing. October 20, uh, 24, 2007. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, it's been a journey for sure. Where are you from originally? North Carolina. North Carolina. So, yeah, there's a little bit of Southern accent that yeah, yeah, comes yeah. through, man, mm -hmm. yeah. But I grew up there and I've, I've been, I left there as pretty much as soon as I could, <laughs> man. Mm -hmm. I, I was ready to tour and play music. And uh, yeah, so like I was saying before, I started when I was 18 and mm -hmm. yeah, North Carolina was where I started. And how long you been with Seven Dust? Since the beginning, man, I, well, I actually we were talking the other day. So I joined uh, Thanksgiving 2000, uh, 2000, 1994 Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so we, we were actually driving through Atlanta the other night. We're like, man, it's been solid 30 years, wow. man. 30 years. Like, that's wow. crazy to 30 us. 30 years with Seven Dust? Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. It is. I didn't know man. that. And then you also were with Corn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is they, it touring guitars? Yeah, it was great, man. Uh, I have nothing but that, you know, I, we might even get into it. But mm -hmm. Corn, man, I, I kind of give them a little credit for like saving my life, man. And my last run with alcohol mm -hmm. was with those guys and I was kind of trying to fix mm -hmm. my life. And and unfortunately, my experience with them was when mm -hmm. I was in that turmoil. You know? One of the other guitars is Wes, right? Yeah, yeah. Wes, yeah. He's in recovery a long time too, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow. I, mean, I talked to him a good bit still. Yeah, we text on social media. So he said he'd do the podcast. It was yeah, cool. he's a great guy, man. Yeah, he was all into, um, oh, what's that guy's name? It's like a psychologist. Uh, he's doing <laughs> some, uh, it's so interesting to see these guys that, you know, we're so hardcore and now they're doing like this meditation retreat oh, yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's into it, man. Yeah, Wes so is like cool. he's a we uh he shared a lot of his life through it. You know, mm -hmm. we met obviously years years back in Head P, mm -hmm. but uh we stayed in touch over the last two, two, 20 years, mm -hmm. you know. When did music take over your life? Um so my mom and my mom and dad were musicians when they met. Uh my dad's a Native American, my mom's Scotch Irish woman. They met uh that in itself was uh when I, growing up i had these two different cultures in my life my my father's side and my mom's the two different th lives but there there was always music in our house my dad was phenomenal uh funk kind of Jimi hendrix type of player mm -hmm. you know and uh my mom was kind of like janis joplin you know and mm -hmm. so that was always around a lot of band a lot of bands practices and the culture was there so um naturally you know we fell into it me and my brothers uh and then you know it was like one of those things my father didn't really want me to do it you know because he knew it was a hard road mm -hmm. he's like academics might but he quit school he, he you know he had a kind of rough life as far as music so he pushed us away but we went you know of course you know if we're gonna do what we're gonna do and once we kind of dedicated ourselves to it he was supportive and then how long how long did it take for you to start like getting into like real bands and stuff like that yeah, I mean, I, where it was weird, man. In North Carolina, you would you would not think this, but when, when I we moved there after my mom and dad divorced when I was eight years old, 
there was this crazy culture of music, like garage bands. Like you would hear drummers, like a lot of dr drummers mm -hmm. in different garages, like jamming out, and you just walk down. So there's just really uh, concentrated a ton of music and musicians in these neighborhoods mm -hmm. I grew up. So I happened to grow, like move right beside this guy, which ended up being my best friend, which mm -hmm. was in music and introduced me to metal and uh, all these rock bands. But I, up until that point, I was kind of in this R and B, like my, what my dad was listening mm -hmm. to at the time, some Lionel Richie and cool in the gang and, mm -hmm. and those kind of things. But then I got introduced to, to rock and metal and in my, you know, 10 to teenage years and just kind of spurred from mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, was alcohol using in the mix at all at that point? Not for me. So my mom, when my mother and father divorced. She, I noticed she was drinking like bush beers, and she started coping like mm -hmm. that. So she, she fell pretty dark into that 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 uh, the drinking, and so I was around a lot of that. And it was you know, it was a couple boyfriends, and kind of volatile mm -hmm. situations started developing. So I, I had a resentment toward alcohol, really until I was 16 years old mm -hmm. and I, I I knew if I'd ever tried it, it was going to be, I would have that type of reaction. I just hated the way that mm -hmm. my mom acted. I was almost like a kid trying to parent my mom in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. So I rebelled against alcohol until I put to that first drink. And mm -hmm. when I did, it was a blackout drunk the first time. Really? Yeah. You believe you were born alcoholic? I believe with the, the trauma, some of the traumas that I had mixed with my, just my reaction, my body's reaction to mm -hmm. alcohol is a stimulant. Like I remember when I, when I drank, it was the first feeling like, why would you stop? Mm -hmm. Like, because all those insecurities, the fears, trauma, that alcohol was such a soothing thing for that. You know, it made me realize I could talk to girls. I can do these things. I can be bolder. Mm -hmm. I can be this kind of exaggerated version of myself. That's the way I felt when I drank the first time. So uh, I really wanted, I wanted all of it in me, you know, I wanted to feel that <laughs> to the extreme. And so I don't know if I was born alcoholic. I think that I was on a, on a chemical level, my, you know, my, the way that, like I said, my body responded to it. I think that, um, that with the conspired of, 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 uh, trauma, yeah. you know, those combinations, the, you know, the mm -hmm. physical allergy they, they talk about, I, I believe I had that. And then how did you get linked up with like your first serious band? Like I said, that culture was incredible. A lot of bands around. So my first real band was this band called Steel Rain. So, you know, not like Steel, like S T I E L. <laughs> mm -hmm. Steel, like S T I L L. Wait, Steel, S T I L like, yeah, or Steel? Like Steel Rain. Like Steel Rain. Okay. Yeah. Like art, art, artsy. <laughs> so we, we were a cover band, right? We, I, I graduated a year early from high school. Joined this cover band, went toward the uh, southeast, some of the north northeast, and uh, it was great, man. So like we started out like that, real regiment band, real healthy, real focused, and we uh, actually were the first cover band that did that circuit to transform into an original act. So we did the same circuit that like these cover bands were playing, but we turned you know, we changed into an original act that did those. And what cover bands were you covering? Oh man, or what bands were you covering? I don't know, some of it, man. It's like, <laughs> you know, you got to think about what was happening then. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, early early 90s, a lot of the grunge stuff. Mm -hmm. We did all the sound gardens, the Pearl Jams. We did some old 80s stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we really, the, we started breaking into Nine Inch Nails, which is, Nine Inch Nails is my, mm -hmm. my all time. So, we were doing, like, obscure ones. We do these weird things. We did, we actually did, like, some Onyx songs, mm -hmm. some hip hop. And, like, we did, really? we, we oh, dressed cool. up in these, we did, like, Ski mat were mm -hmm. very uh, energetic, and uh, we broke some of the little typical mm -hmm. molds, you know. Was your drinking ever getting in the way then? Yeah, I, we were drinking. At, you know, it was funny because I, I would imagine everyone kind of was. Yeah, it was the it was the vibe. Everyone was drinking. That was the culture of it. We were playing bars, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I was, you know, that was a what I call the the golden drinking era where there wasn't a lot of consequences. Mm -hmm. I actually found a diary that I kept for two years in the early nineties at my mom when my mom passed. And I always questioned, man, was I, was I alcoholic? Was I identifying myself mm -hmm. then as one? And I, I was reading these entries and it was always like at the end of the entry, I need to stop, man. I've wow. been doing it, been burning that down too much, this and that. In the language that I was speaking mm -hmm. then, it was, you know, it was kind of funny <laughs> listening to 20, 21 year version of myself. I'm like, man, you're a punk, <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, I was reading that and I was like, man, I did, there was, there was issues. And then 
you know, like you said, the, the culture was drinking. And so it was easy. If you have issues with drinking and you're around that rock and roll environment, it's mm -hmm. easy to, to fall down that slope. And then how did it turn into like being in bigger bands? So did, I, did it immediately go to Seven Dust? Yeah, so I, I was talking to some of the guys. Atlanta was a real big music scene. We had migrated there, mm -hmm. and we, we called that our home. And I met some of the guys, Seven Dust. They were a, a band called Crawl Space at the time. And I was like, the drummer, Morgan, you know, he's my best friend. Mm -hmm. So he, he's, he's one of the most incredible drummers ever. And he was, I always watched him. You know, there's a huge competitive scene in Atlanta. I'd see him, I want to play with that guy, man. So we would, he was courting me, I was courting him. I jumped ship from that Steel Rain band, which was pretty established at the time. Mm -hmm. I was making a little money and it was okay. And, but it was discouraging because we couldn't get a record deal. So I jumped ship, which was not heard of back then because they, their band opened up for us. Mm -hmm. And then I joined them, took a risk, lived there, didn't have no, you know, no money, nothing really. And then about six months later, we get, record label accidentally comes into the club we're playing and they, they, they see us and they, you know, obviously try to strike a deal with us. And that's, that's kind of how the seven dust thing happened. And then how, how has like the next couple of years progressed for you with like using and like the band, is there like a lot of drama between you guys? Are you guys like pretty cool at that point? Um, in, in terms of like seven dust, like, mm -hmm. yeah. So when I first joined, they, they were drinking on a different level. And like still, they're drinking more than you. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I said, still rain was a very health conscious band. We were, <laughs> we were like kind of healthy. So these other guys I got there and Lejean was smoking a little weed during practice. I'm like during mm -hmm. practice, y'all are drinking. And <laughs> so I loved it. I, I, I joined right into that culture. And, uh, I had a lot of fear when I jumped ship to that band. So what I naturally did at that point in my life, when I was in fear, uncomfortable situations, I would drink, drink my way through it. Uh, that was the first time that I actually, consciously leaned on that to to deal with my emotions mm -hmm. and um that was the, I, the first time i noticed that and so i love seven dust we got a deal right away we went straight on the road and you know we were a signed act so back then it was a huge thing right now today it's not being signed or not signed you mm -hmm. could do so much on social media without labels but we were uh we were out there doing the deal uh that's the first time i started experimenting with cocaine and different drugs outside I, Cause I, I always told myself, I'll never touch this. I'll never touch that. You know, I'll never stoop to those lows. Mm -hmm. And you know, as I went, it just sort of pulling me in. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll do this, but I won't shoot it. And I mm -hmm. won't do the, you know, I won't take it to that next level. And it was always okay. Wow. You know? Well, it seemed like you were able to use for a long time. I did, man. Um, I, I would say my, I, it was from, 27 to 36 i got sober when i was mm -hmm. 36 and that those last six years were the darkest and that's where everything started unraveling mm -hmm. uh attempts at sobriety a few different stints in treatment arrest duis mm -hmm. uh just all the signs all the things that you start losing now what's going on with you when so when it starts to get like you know unmanageability and stuff like that what's going on with the band are they try, are they also as bad as you or are they are you trying to like lean on them or are they trying to pull you out yeah, you know. that's a, that's a great. So, and we always laugh about this today. Mm -hmm. So I was, they, they, everyone partied. Mm -hmm. Everyone was throwing it down on a high level. And I use that as an excuse all the time, every time they would call me out. So I was like, a, in a band full of Keith Richards, mm -hmm. I was the worst. Mm -hmm. I was the worst of all these guys that were doing it on a high level and functioning. And uh, But they would always pull me to side. And I started getting to a point where I was a, a terrible drunk. So I was aggressive. I was attacking some of the other band members verbally, mm -hmm. physically. And so there'd be a lot of sit downs, man. You got to, mm -hmm. you got to dial this in a lot of consequences. I, I was married at the time, my first marriage, and there was issues going on there mm -hmm. and all the things that just happen when you make those decisions and blackouts and uh, that you're trying to fix all these problems. Every day I wake up, there's a new fire I got to put out. There's mm -hmm. an apology. There's, there's something I got to do to, to make things right, you know? And, uh, it was just exhausting. Mm -hmm. Were you trying to get clean during that time? And were they like honest attempts? No, you know, I think the first time I went to, it was an, it was an outpatient program mm -hmm. in Louisville, Kentucky. And, uh, I went there to just to get the heat off. Like people say a lot. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just, and at that time, I honestly naive, I, I thought all I needed to do was go through this program and mm -hmm. I would be cured. 
they're going to take this alcoholism for me and then, you know, I'll be fine. And then maybe I'll be able to drink a little bit. If that was my mindset. Mm -hmm. And then, then I got in there and I started learning a little bit. I'm like, man, that does sound pretty accurate. You know, like <laughs> that, that, I feel like I fit in this. So mm -hmm. I got a couple of seeds planted mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, I put a year, like I, I mentioned to you before, I put a year in of dry sobriety. It was like I, I knew a little bit, mm -hmm. but I wasn't working 12. I wasn't doing any kind of program. I was mm -hmm. just clean. I felt better. But I had this really, I had this inner like anger issue when I was sober, very condescending, very, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I let that feed my ego in a way. So in a lot of ways, I was kind of a miserable person to be around mm -hmm. because I was judging all my band members. Are they still drinking? Yeah, yeah. They're still drinking you like, oh, on your high horse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And a critical spirit, and mm -hmm. it made it uneasy for them. And uh, so that was a miserable year. But I had got an injury, started taking some Percocet, and that I'd never taken pills up until that point. And then I started doing those that kind of exist in these social si situations. Mm -hmm. When you're on tour, you're around a lot of people. And I took a couple of those, and then that kind of led to me, you know, getting them shipped all over mm -hmm. the world, just doing anything. And I was terrible at scoring drugs <laughs> for some reason. Thank God. I just was, I was never mm -hmm. that great at it. And, uh, there was a couple of instances had I landed some of the, the supply that I wanted, I mm -hmm. would have been dead for sure, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, luckily, you know, that now at that time, are you still doing like, are you like drink, are you drinking and doing cocaine and opiates? Yeah. Well, what broke the straw, what, what happened was I, I went to Australia, went to Australia. Now I was out of my flow. I had no contacts. Mm -hmm. I was hitting up the promoter. Like I have anxiety. Mm -hmm. I need these pills and couldn't get it. So all of a sudden after a year of being dry, you know, no, no alcohol, mm -hmm. uh, just saw a wine bottle sitting there in a the dressing room, just mm -hmm. like that started drinking. And then it really, everything that I had, the pills, I had all these new barriers. Mm -hmm. There were no barriers. It was everything at that point. And that's when it really, the last five or six years was just mm -hmm. rough. What are like some crazy stories of like being on tour at that time? Um, a lot of the things that happened with Seven Dust, man, um, it wasn't even like exciting firework stories. It was just like really, really dark, uh, mm -hmm. just a numbness that, took over for a few years what really happened as far as the craziness was when i had done the corn thing because i was trying they had i had a stint of, in rehab and I, another stint of outpatient and they contacted me and i was i was out of seven dust mm -hmm. at this time i left the band and joined this other band dark new day and was trying to get my i thought that would that change would get me sober mm -hmm. let me surround myself by people that aren't doing it and that was a whole nightmare in itself. But the corn thing is when it all kind of came to head, I was close to divorce. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I got arrested in Slovakia. Um, I actually had a sponsor at the time and he was like, you don't need to go out tonight. Like he'd hear me talking. I was mm -hmm. always trying to lie to him. And he was a great guy, man. And uh, he is a great guy. He, he was like, man, you, you should stay in that hotel, man. Slovakia is not a place you want to get arrested. <laughs> and I go out and I, you know, act a fool and black out and get arrested there. And it was honestly one of the lowest uh, points. Cause I really thought it, it was not like a, you know, prison or jail that that's, it's a no joke place in the first place, but there it was just a darker and they really had it out for me. Mm -hmm. American, you know, typical American July 4th, mm. you know, they, <laughs> they, uh, they weren't real. They weren't, you know, there was a lot. Of, they beat the hell out of me, and it's just really a scary situation. I was in my boxers, and was the jail just like horrendous? Oh, it was brutal, man. I, it was a, you know, pee in a in a hole in this like dirt floor, <laughs> metal doors, huge guards, and this. Uh, they brought this other guy in, to sit in the cell with me, and his face was mangled. Mm -hmm. I could hear it going down outside. The cops beating him. Yeah, and he came in there. He was sitting there, man. And it was the deepest, most, you know, foxhole prayer that I've ever done in my life. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was losing my bowels. I, I was, it was a scary situation for me at the time, man. And luckily they brokered me out of there. The promoter of the show in mm -hmm. Slovakia came and the chief of police just happened to be a fan of corn. Wow. And it was like, oh, we got this knucklehead from corn. He's like, oh, I'll let him out. That was the only, cause they were they, in broken English. They were like, you, you're not getting out. Wow. We're going to, we're going to put some charges on you, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, some extra ones, <laughs> so, you know, and I laughed about it a little bit today, but it, it was rough, man. <laughs> not it was funny. There, very yeah. scary, man. Yeah. And then of course, you know, I get out of there. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm done. And the corn guys were like, man, they were kind of laughing it off. Mm -hmm. So man, you need to dial it in. 
And uh, sure enough, I wasn't ready yet still. Yeah, it's crazy because Corn is such a big band. It's like, I remember as a kid, it was just so popular. You yeah. know, it's just crazy. Um, did did What was it like, like being like famous and like being in like these big bands and and your addiction? Like, how are you handling that? Well, I mean, Corn was like... You know, that was, I was on the outside of that. Like, mm -hmm. I loved Corn. Seven Dust had a tremendous amount of respect in that community. Um, so that was, a, I guess, the most famous that I ever was, was while I was in my, you know, my normal Seven Dust outfit. Um, going to Corn was kind of, there was a lot of humility that was kind of put on me because I, I, I was going in there thinking I'm going to be the, I'm going to be the guy, because they had a couple replacements for Head at the time. And I was like, man, I really want to come in there and just be the be what Head was because mm -hmm. I loved Head, loved everything they did. And I just really wanted to do well, and um, they were they knocked me down quick, man. I was like, no, nah, this is because they they res they protected their circle, and mm -hmm. I, I respect that. You know, they they've been through all that. They built themselves up from nothing, so I, I I understand it. But it was I felt on the outside of that whole thing, so immediately. Um, th even the so the first show I ever did with them was on Jay Leno. It was acoustic. And I never met these guys. Like mm -hmm. never we we practiced two days before. And I drank the night before I flew out to do that and mm -hmm. got a DUI. No. And they had told me, said, man, do not, if you have an issue with drinking, we, you know, we hear you're doing good, but mm -hmm. if we hear you're gonna be out. So I hid that right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Got a DUI because I was excited, you know. Got out of jail, went, flew over there, did the did that show with them, and then it was always it was a weird thing because it was like I'm gonna hide this alcohol. Uh, I'm gonna I, I'll do the shows and I'll play and I would do like two days sober mm -hmm. and then have a day off and then just go off the rails on my days off. So mm -hmm. they would hear these stories like, man, man, we heard you were at this place and like, mm -hmm. no man, I was in my hotel, just lying, mm -hmm. you know. And and they were um they were super cool about it, man. It started coming. I, I, you could only hide that kind of that kind mm -hmm. of drinking and that kind of behavior for so long before it gets, you know, obviously loud and starts affecting the organization. So they they were cool about it, but they were like, man, they they put a couple mm -hmm. put their foot down, like, man, we can't have this. Monkey was going through some stuff at the time, and Joey Jordison was the drummer. Uh, he was going through stuff at the time, mm -hmm. and um, you know, rest his soul, he he passed away, mm -hmm. and yeah, so. That was kind of the craziness. The craziest it got was during that corn period. Did you believe in God at this point or have any type of spiritual spirituality? Yeah. Um, I always believed um my connection with God was was weak. Um, I didn't in my heart of hearts, I always had this feeling that there was uh, you know, obviously I believed in God. That I grew up in typical Christian. My grandfather was a preacher. My mom, that 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 was the foundation as far as my spiritual out, my my connection to God. But um, I did love the aspect of what some of the programs, some of the people had taught me about not really having to define exactly what that was, just to get my relationship back to a God of my understanding. It it, mm -hmm. it, it just made it easier for me because there was a resentment. There were I was very skeptical and. Through my alcoholism, it really got me distant. It got me bitter, uh, but it, I believe I truly believe that connection to God for me was was a huge thing in terms of steering me into mm -hmm. that complete surrender piece that I really needed. You know, deflation of ego, mm -hmm. um, service, things like that that really felt that were kind of absent in my life at that time. But the the God thing was a huge thing and still is and. And again, it's an ongoing relationship. It mm -hmm. changes. There's sometimes that signals really weak. Mm -hmm. I get caught in myself a lot, but um, I, I do believe I, I got on my knees today and, and pray. And it's just the, the act of doing that, the physicality of getting on your knees mm -hmm. and yeah, it does something about it, yeah. and it feels good. What um what was your relationship with like twelve step programs? Did you believe in the twelve steps? Did you have people in your life that were in the program that were trying to help you, did you think it was like a hoax or like a cult or something? Yeah, all those things, mm -hmm. man. It, um, I actually, the first time I saw the steps, I, I read through them sitting in one of those rooms. Yeah, oh, I did them. <laughs> I said, yeah, man, I'm good, man. I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm aligned with that stuff. Um, and and I say it all the time, man, it, regardless of alcoholism or drug addiction, whatever, I feel like if you, if you legitimately go through those things, mm -hmm. just 
just go through those steps and in and, and your way and, and with all the zeal that you have, I think it'll improve, it'll improve anybody's life. Mm-hmm. It, it's pretty, you know, and there's nothing wrong with being a service. There's nothing wrong with accepting, you know, mm-hmm. looking at your defects and making amends. And, and the moral inventory. Yeah, mm-hmm. and the moral, all that stuff is valuable and it's good and it's good practice to do. Um, I didn't like the program because I knew it was right. And I knew if I honestly did it, that it I'd have to give up yeah. all the things that I was doing at mm-hmm. the time to to make myself feel better. Yeah, I know. Like for me in the beginning, it's like, oh, I'll never get clean. Nothing's ever going to work. Da, 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 da. And then you look at the program, you see all these people are like way worse than you and they're clean. And then you're scared that it might work. And yeah, like, yeah. Well, now I don't have any excuse. And yeah. You know, now I really can't ever use, you know. Yeah. Um. So what situation or tragic event led you to seeking treatment or recovery again while you're with corn and how do they influence that so what what they did was we were in florida actually i think west palm and then they had given me the last you get one more strike Mm -hmm. so we had out on this tour and uh i had went on a dark you know a bad bender you know was at this hotel and you know, I acted a fool. Like a lot of the, a lot of the crew and a lot of the band saw me. The next day, I wake up. My manager at the time gives me a call. He says, "Hey, man, you're flying home." Mm-hmm. And then my wife at the time, you know, she she had put her foot down. She's like, "If if you get th- you know if you lose this opportunity, we're done." Uh, the other band I had, uh, you know, because I was with Corn, but I had this other uh, this other band that was still kind of developing. Mm-hmm. And they're like, "If you." You know, so I lost pretty much everything. I got that, got on that plane, flew home, got divorced, I had no money, no house. Uh, there was a treatment center about uh, in in town. I, I had two or three days at my home by myself, and mm-hmm. I was in. Uh, there was a, we had this decorative uh, these bottles on top of this man. They took all the alcohol out of the house, and I was just waiting for a couple of days to get in this treatment center. And they thought they cleaned out everything out. And there were these two bottles on this fireplace with this decorative stuff. And it's like the most rancid. There was like these peppers in it, some real brutal, you know, really high, uh, high level alcohol. And I, I pulled it down. I remember I had nothing but that and these uh, Girl Scout cookies. Mm-hmm. And for three days, I didn't drink. And I saw that. And I was like, man. And I, I remember taking the top off and like, I wonder if this will get me drunk. I took a couple of sips and I, this stuff could have killed me. I didn't know what it was. It smelled brutal. Mm-hmm. And I, I took a couple of sips and the insanity of that. I was like, man, I don't know if this is going to kill me, but it might get me drunk. Mm. So I'm going to drink this. And that was my last drink. I, I drank that whole jug of this stuff. And, and the guy that was getting me in the spot, getting me into this program, he managed to pull some strings and get me in there for free. Mm-hmm. He said, I'm going to give you this one opportunity. A lot of people get kicked out of these treatment centers because they don't have insurance. You know, you're, I'm going to pull this one string, but you 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 better put all in. Mm-hmm. So I w- at that point, it was a relief almost because I was tragically, like I felt very close to suicide. I, I, I had a conversation with a guy and he we talk about it today. And, he, you know, my drummer, I was like, well, mm-hmm. I don't understand. Well, what, what, what's holding me back from just shoot, putting a bullet in my head? Mm-hmm. Like, what would be so bad about that? You know, um, it would probably put a lot of people at ease because I've been such a burden on everyone and hit that lowest low drinking that. And, um, and Ricky was his name. He's like, you know, I'm going to get you in this, I'm gonna get you in this thing. And I want to, you know, the jig is up, man. You, you don't have any more options. And it, it was at the point, a lot of things were discovered, all the lies and all mm-hmm. the things that I was just kind of, it all manifested to this low. And I was there. I remember sitting in that treatment center and just, tell me what to do you know complete surrender mm-hmm. um that like you know now since since being in this this recovery world i hear all the time these these similar events where you just hit this this point where it's not a relief but you're like i just i'm ready mm-hmm. i felt very ready to accept the information to thoroughly do these steps and uh, commit myself to it and with no no expectations of what's going to happen the next day just mm-hmm. all in that moment what was that stand in treatment like this time it was it was the first time i did inpatient and man i was i was i was playing a show of corn you know four or five days before that then i was sweeping doing my chores <laughs> doing my list doing my things and it was a, it was a treatment center was connected to a, a psych unit too so there were people in 
medical gowns. Mm-hmm. We're all eating lunch together and all like, I mean, cut, you know, people cut mm-hmm. all these psychological, like serious stuff. And I felt at home. I was like, I, I, I didn't look at them like, oh, they're crazy. Mm-hmm. I'm, I, I'm in this weird place. Like, I was like, this is where I need to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm exactly where mm-hmm. I need to be, I, you know. Uh, so. Yeah, and a lot of people have um, like this idea of like they want to go to this special rehab or it's got to have this amenity or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I always tell people is like, dude, an attitude of surrender is going to be the difference of you staying clean or not. Not if they have a hot tub, not if they have a pool. Mm-mm. So it's like I always tell people like, dude, treatment's going to teach you surrender. Yeah. And if you're able to learn that wherever you're at, it's going to work. And then wherever you're at, if you don't learn that, it ain't going to work. You're right, man. And I had this other guy tell me, he said, man, he says, you can go to now. Naz- you can go to now. Naz- you can go anywhere if you're not willing. Mm hmm. And I was like, you know, I don't, just, I don't know, but, and, you know, he said, take 30 days, man. I said, just, just to clear your mind enough to where you are willing to accept some information. Mm-hmm. Like you, you, you can't physically stop drinking. I couldn't at that time. Mm-hmm. So even just having that 30 days of just, you know, and that doesn't, and statistically it's not, and it's not in the favor of sobriety. Mm-hmm. A lot of people go in there, you know, and they struggle. I was an habitual relapser myself, man, but that was a, uh, from that point on, mm-hmm. um, you know, I was working a roofing job. Even after I finished that, I, I was driving my bicycle. I had a bicycle. Mm-hmm. It was two miles up the road. I drive in the middle of the winter uh, to go do the after aftercare and help the new people coming in. I, I loved it, man. I was all in. I just did. You not go back into music right away? I didn't, and I was going to give myself a year. And I was roofing houses with. Who this other- suggested that? So, my drummer. We had talked, mm-hmm. and I had been out of seven us for a few years, and he had heard I was getting out of treatment. And I was mm-hmm. like, man, he was just a good friend throughout all that. And uh, he's like, man, I know you're, you know, I know you're getting through this. I'm so proud of you. Uh, but man, it would be kind of cool if you came back. You know, we started talking to each mm-hmm. other about. First, it was about repairing my relationships with my old band members because I had done things I needed to make amends for. Mm-hmm. So it was just about being friends again, being brothers again, talking to each other. And then it was natural, like, man, you know, I got, it would be so cool to get back together. And I said, I'm not ready yet, um, but let's maybe plan on doing it next year. They had, they had just done a a record and they were going to do a full cycle, which is about 18 months. I'm like, man, yeah, I'm doing my thing here. And then we kept talking. And then my sponsor at the time was like, man, you know, I don't really think this is a great idea. Historically, you've you've went back mm-hmm. out of me in times in those situations, but um, you know, if you if you choose to do that, you know, there's certain things I want you to really you know commit to doing when you're mm-hmm. on tour. And I put a plan together. Uh, meetings, I just every day I was at meetings. The guy that I that replaced me in Seven Dust, mm-hmm. Sonny Mayo, he was sober. He mm-hmm. did his whole stint with Seven Dust, so I was communicating with him later on about his mm-hmm. how he survived seven dust <laughs> sober you know because yeah. i didn't want i wanted to be able to play music and i didn't want it to hinge on the fact if i was of the band that drank or not i wanted to have a foundation and i never looked at, i looked at them a lot differently i didn't judge them mm-hmm. or make them feel uncomfortable for their decisions but and they 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 were great to me and still are you know mm-hmm. Yeah, because a lot of people that I know that are like in entertainment or sales or have any like high pressure job, a lot of times when they get out of treatment, people suggest that they don't go back to that for at least a year or six months at least or something. Yeah. And man, I just see so many people in the rush to nowhere. And it's just like, you know, it's so hard to tell someone like, dude, I'm telling you, the job's going to be there in a year. Like I'm telling you that yeah. if you go back in a year, you're going to be able to sustain what you got. And there's so many people that I see that as soon as they get out, the first thing they want to do is go back into entertainment or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, man, that little break, it's not going to change your career. And you're going to, it's, it's, I mean, it's hard, man. A lot of people don't listen. It's a blink of an eye, too, if you think about it. You know, know. Give yourself a year, man. It's like, and then you, through that, you get that foundation. Mm-hmm. And you have to, I think statistically, it's the more time you have, the better chance you mm-hmm. have of surviving those things. But, I went out, it was, it was, I had six months mm-hmm. solid, you know, and it was all in like two meetings a day. Like mm-hmm. I was all in. So when did you start to believe in like the 12 step program? Like think that it wasn't like full of shit and like a cult or something like that. When did you like think like, man, I'm really going to commit to this or this is a lifestyle I could get with. 
Well, first, the one thing I really had to understand, this took a few people to explain to me is that, you know, you're not going to just because everyone you meet in these rooms and all these people, they're not fixed. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of dysfunction. There's a lot of there's a lot of issues within this that there's a lot of solution in here, too. Mm -hmm. But don't just expect every person you walk up to to have every answer. Uh, yeah. They're struggling. They're here because they're working, still working. Find the people that, you know, that you see something you want and mm -hmm. be, surround yourself with them. And uh I realized that when I stopped lying, like, you know, because there's such a, you have to be honest in these, in this program, you have to be, you have to give that all in terms of you're honest with yourself, honest with other people, the, the humility that comes with that. So once I was getting through like, you know, the inventory part, I was always doing these inventories and leaving stuff out, you know, like the darkest mm -hmm. little crannies like it talks about. And I, I just wasn't willing to fully commit to it. And when I opened myself up and was completely vulnerable and I really started feeling the psyche that, you know, all the things you hear, there's, the, you know, I was really skeptical because the cliches of AA and the things that you hear all the time, I, I hated them. They annoyed me because I knew again, they were right. But it was like, that's what I was just trying to find loopholes and trying to find things to pick at with the whole program as a whole. But once I really honestly put that work in and kept it simple and found the guys that were just trying to do it on that one day to day basis, um, I started feeling these changes and I started feeling a, a true connection to God. I started um, feeling peace, which was I used to look at these guys that be sitting in the program and they look peaceful. And I'm like, man. Cause I see a lot of people agitated and kind of mm -hmm. like on, you know, pink clouds and all these things, mm -hmm. but I'd see a, tr a guy that was truly at peace. And I'm talking about going through major traumas in his life, losing his wife to cancer and, mm -hmm. you know, um, his son getting arrested, like, dealing with real life. And they still sat in peace. I'm like, that is a powerful thing, man. Mm -hmm. If I could, that's what was so attractive to me, like life on life's terms, these people were dealing with it and they were still cool and they were still committed. And they, of course they had emotions and they had things, uh, you know, that they didn't handle great all the time, mm -hmm. but they kept a piece to them. And I just thought that was like a powerful thing just to be still mm -hmm. in those moments. And yeah, there's some people in the program that um, like growing up, like, yeah, like I like seeing like celebrities and stuff like that. When I got clean, like I was always trying to like hang out with like, the cool people at the meetings and stuff. But there are some people in the program that, man, they got no social media. Mm -hmm. They got a regular job. They've been married, you know, 20 something years. They're not like the best speaker. You know, they've sponsored a couple guys, but man, they are probably like the pinnacle yeah. of what I think like a man should be. Yeah. You know, like I look at them and I'm like, you know, like that's what like a real life should look like. They're just good people. They just help the next person. They're not looking for accolades. They're not trying to be something they're not. They're just downright honest loving mm -hmm. grateful to be clean yeah they're just making the coffee they've been doing this for 20 years like they just have this attitude of gratitude and like this feeling of like i don't it's just unexplainable and like you know when i first got clean i would kind of like not see it but yeah. after like you keep going to meetings you keep going to meetings and like the guy who you think is crazy or doesn't have it all together you're like, no he actually has the most knowledge mm -hmm. he's actually like the the guru here you know yeah it's crazy and that putting putting it into real life you know practical use um it's not always easy man like you say you, you know i anytime i notice something with you know something that annoys me about another person usually it's something that is mm -hmm. in me that I'm, and that was a huge turnaround thing for me. Like, I I've, I I can read people's demeanor. I, I I've been around so many people. I can I can understand their body language mm -hmm. and, and things. And and what it's really what it really is is me seeing my own defects in them mm -hmm. because I'm like I I've been selfish like that. I've been self seeking like that. Mm -hmm. I've been you know my motives have been sneaky like his mm -hmm. or, or like you know I've and once it, it kind of diffused a little bit of my ego and made me realize that. To, to love people more and be more compassionate because mm -hmm. I see a lot of myself in these, the annoyances are just yeah, a reflection, reflection of me, you know? Mm -hmm. That's what it seems like. Uh, what was like your first couple of years and what was it like adjusting to like being in the band and now you're sober and now you're not drinking and like, did it seem sustainable? Was there like temptation? Was there times where you almost used, how did you like lean on the program and meetings and stuff? 
um, you know, I was attacking meetings at first. Um, just the just the search for meetings every day was a, a spiritual thing because mm -hmm. the act of doing it in mm -hmm. itself is like, man, this I'm into this. I need it. I like mm -hmm. it. I enjoy it. I went to terrible places in town, like whatever it took, you know. And so that in itself, there was one particular day about a year into it, I was drinking Diet Coke and uh there's this huge beer cooler in the bus, you know, mm -hmm. and there, I knew there was Diet Cokes in there. I, and I'd searched through this thing. Mm -hmm. I'm like Miller Lite after Miller Lite. And mm -hmm. I grabbed this Diet Coke at the bottom and I sat down and I, I got like teary eyed because it was the first time I actually, I just wanted this Diet Coke. I knew it was cold. <laughs> I didn't think about like, and honestly didn't think about, oh, it'd be nice to have, they did not, it wasn't mm -hmm. even on my radar. It was the first time. And that, that I always thought was impossible. I thought there would always be this, underlining feeling of i still Jones. want to i'm not doing mm -hmm. it but i'm you know and it, and it was truly like that obsession had been lifted and i mm -hmm. I, I was concentrated on a diet coke so it was a really good indication at that time i can do this if i keep doing these things on a daily basis that built where i'm at today i can continue this if i want mm -hmm. um there's been years i mean through all these Years there's been years where I've completely been disassociated with the program, done my own thing. I stay in touch with a lot mm -hmm. of alcoholics, but as far as like meetings, there's you know a couple of years where it's true lull, like mm -hmm. hardly any at all. Um, the spiritual connection has been there, but man, there's been times where I really fall off and mm -hmm. I have to kind of work my way back in. Yeah, and I think that it's important for people to see that it's like I've always gone to meetings and I've never not gone to meetings, so. For me, it's hard for me to like imagine that, but I'm also still single and never had kids, you know. So yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, I also like don't have too much going on. You yeah, know? I, man, I got I got two kids, mm -hmm. sports. There, there's yeah. so much service work going mm -hmm. on. Uh, I love being a dad. That's mm -hmm. been that's been a highlight of my life. But man, yeah, you, if had I not had these kids, I'd yeah, be, it'd be yeah. meeting. I mean, yeah. I, I still I miss my meetings. Mm -hmm. I got my home group. You know, I do a lot of Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a group of musicians and people in the industry. Oh, that's we, cool. We do a, a Zoom, cool. Zoom meeting all the time. And, uh, what was when? So when I got clean, um, so it was like the reverse of drugs. So like when I was on drugs, I would just meet people who also were on drugs and meet so many. <laughs> like I would be at like a party and be like the one kid who smokes crack, and like you know, I would just always find the drug addicts. And when I got clean, I just randomly started finding people in recovery because that's what I was looking for. Sure. And I realized that there are so many people, you know, in my area that were in recovery and stuff like that. W was it like that for you in the music industry where when you got clean, you started to see like all these other people are also clean? And Absolutely, man. Mm -hmm. that, that's funny, man. So, so, you know, once you get in certain circles, I was reaching out to a lot of people like, man, who, anyone on this tour? Um you know, I was seeking them out, but there would always be these run-ins, those odd or God things, you know, like, mm -hmm. you, you know, your friend of Bill's and all, all these little <laughs> conversations, you get a feeling from certain people. Um, I met a, a, a lot of people that had been sober years and had no idea, mm -hmm. had no idea they were in the program. People I had done tours with that mm -hmm. was currently on tours with, and we find out halfway through, like, hey, man, let's go to a meeting together, you know, and... um yeah, man, I, it is what it's what you're looking for, mm -hmm. like little signs, like you know. I'm trying to look for opportunities to be of service mm -hmm. to people, man. If if I wake up with that intention, I, mm -hmm. I, magically I'll start seeing opportunities, yeah. you know. Um, when did you meet your wife? Um, I met her indirectly. I her, there, there's some connections with family, and my bass mm -hmm. player's married to her family mm -hmm. or her you know he's married into them so i knew of her for a lot, a lot of years but um ironically enough she had a brother um that was struggling he had just gotten into treatment and uh he she was i was the only i had rejoined seven dust and she had said you're the only person i know that's sober and i had about a year or two at the time so we connected on that mm -hmm. side and um struck a relationship up we were both kind of in relationships at mm -hmm. the time we just stayed in touch after that and then a relationship started forming after that because you know there was a little spark there mm -hmm. and, and she's been incredible and her you know her name's tara she's mm -hmm. she she's the mother of my two children and she's my best friend and it's the first relationship in my life that i've ever been completely honest with mm -hmm. i have no secrets I, you know she's never been with me you know during my drinking so 
you know, it's a kind of a living amend in a way mm-hmm. with a lot of relationships I've had in the past that I did so much damage to those people. And so it was my opportunity to have a, a good, real relationship. And she's been every, you know, she's huge and just uh, the life we have together. You know, she, she has a drink or two here and there mm-hmm. and yeah, by no stretch of the imagination is alcoholic, you know, yeah. but, uh, she, but she's a, uh, she's a great person. She's a great mother and a good friend and, Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. That's awesome, man. Well, how has ha- having kids like changed your life? It, it was a huge. Did you I, want to be a dad? I did, man. Mm-hmm. I was 39 years old when I had my first mm-hmm. and uh, I was ready. Um, I, I had with the way that my childhood looked and, and how yeah, there was there was love and there were things like that. But there was it was very volatile that, you know, there were there was a, you know, my mom's boyfriend was murdered in my, my house. Uh you know, a lot of dysfunction, a lot of things mm-hmm. happening. So I, I have the opportunity to provide this environment for my kids that doesn't look anything like that. And it's not the best thing that has been, you know, as far as being a parent, it's not the best, but it is a huge, I, I see it as a gift um, because it was, it's the childhood I always wanted. Mm-hmm. It's what I'm giving to them. And um, whether they know it or not, you know, I, I just look and every day of their life looks so much safer than mine. It was such a different situation. And there's, certain aspects to the life that I grew up in that made me a stronger person, a street smarts mm-hmm. that my kids don't have none no. of, you know, they don't know <laughs> none of that, you know, mm-hmm. and I just watch people and I'm like, yeah, yeah man, um, but they don't, you know, so sometimes like I, I try to install some of those things like, Hey, you know, mm-hmm. you're not around these things, but this, you got to look out for, you know, mm-hmm. you got to do certain things. So there's, there's things I can pass on to them <laughs> in terms of survival, but, um, it's incredible, man. I, I I just I cherish every moment I have with them. Mm-hmm. A lot of parents, you know, I leave for a little, you know, beer, you know, like a month here, two months there. So when I'm home with them, I'm all in. And um, you know, some parents, oh, I just want to put my kid in school and do my thing. But I'm mm-hmm. just all in with them. I love spending moments with them, and they're they're good kids, and we hear good things about them, and. It's just, just I mean, it gives me so much joy. My little boy at one point is like, Dad, I think I'm going to be sober when I grow up. What? I, was like, I was like, man, I was driving. And like, my, <laughs> my eyes started watering. I was like, Ugh. But I'm, I'm like, I saw, you know, we'll, we'll take it day by day, you know. Mm-hmm. But it was cool that, he, that he, he, he framed, the way he looked at it was, you know, he was basically trying to say, you know, mm-hmm. you're a good guy, you know. I remember uh, my friend's son was like, some like w- he went to hang out with one of my like his other friends and they were drinking or something and when he got back in the car his son was crying he's like what's going on he's like your friend was drinking he's like oh yeah some people can drink and he started crying he's like he's gonna die that. <laughs> <laughs> just like, he, he just you know he yeah. just really thinks that like bro people who drink alcohol are gonna die yeah you know and uh he just been around the program so long so it's really interesting yeah because it's like um, it wasn't until I got clean I started to see like what real healthy family dynamics were and mm-hmm. that like it's even possible and you know there's this guy in recovery he's been clean like a long time and his daughter went to like my middle school and um, over the years I just seen them together and it's like dude the whole family wears white and like they go on the beach and do kudalini yoga and they take like pictures together yeah. it's just like it's just crazy that there's you know both opposites have to exist. So if there's like that crazy toxic family dynamic, there has to be like a super healthy family dynamic. Too. Yeah. I, my wife's family, they were completely in no issues there. They were, mm-hmm. you know, pretty straight laced family. They obviously, her brother had mm-hmm. issues with alcohol and stuff, but I was like almost, I was very like, I don't want to say cynical. Mm-hmm. I, I was very, every time I see that bit like that, not beaver cleaver kind of yeah but like people just being honest and nice to each other and mm-hmm. no 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 you know psychological warfare <laughs> or screaming and yeah yelling. screaming and like brutal emotions and um so like i was like ah, that's too good to be true mm-hmm. man i don't trust this you know like she's like you know and i tell her stories about my upbringing she's like you know that ain't that's not normal yeah that's that's pretty brutal i'm like yeah you're it? telling a funny story they're like that's child yeah. abuse yeah, yeah. <laughs> A hundred percent. She's like, uh, she's like, you know, she's like staring out the window mm-hmm. like, oh, you, oh, that's terrible. But yeah, I was like, I was used to it. Mm-hmm. It was normal. Our Christmases were brutal, man. Like, you know, just all kinds of stuff. Um, What uh, what do you do now for like your mental health and to like other than like meetings and stuff like that? Um, I'm, I'm a huge uh, 
fitness junkie, man. I, I've been in, I've been in the fitness game for you know for years and years. A huge believer in what that does. Mm -hmm. um, now you know there's a lot of social media support in terms of what these things do with the ice plunges and the, <laughs> the training and everyone's drinking that Kool Aid. Yeah. But th those things were for me. I credit that you know almost as much in terms of just my mind my headspace mm -hmm. on a daily basis the stress and and the typical things it's been a huge uh factor in my sobriety and, and maintaining that through mm -hmm. those years of not so much going to the media yeah mm -hmm. and um and so i i love it man it makes me feel feel good it's not the vanity part you know mm -hmm. there's always like yeah, i want to look good and but i really it's i just feel so much better man like mm -hmm. if i get a good training day in and I love boxing. I love, I love rowing, cycling, mm -hmm. lifting, everything. I just love it. I never played sports growing up. Mm -hmm. My son and my daughter play. So I'm like, I, I love the athleticism mm -hmm. of life. So I'm learning a lot. You know, I've always played basketball. I'm playing a lot with my son. Oh, my knee, cool. knees are paying for it. <laughs> but I love, I love, I love all that, man. So um, being active is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. Huge thing. How has it been with other musicians that have like reached out to you for help? Like, how, what, would you suggest or what like some stories you've had with helping other addicts? I, I it's you know, like they say, it's one of the best it's, it's in terms mm -hmm. of keeping your own sobriety, giving yeah. some of it away. Dude, I love it, man. If someone I and I try to contain my excitement when someone does reach out. Mm -hmm. Uh we've had some, you know, in internally in our band now with Seven Dust, you know, um, you know, a guy or two has his problems and he see me, I try not to do the, you know, I try to just let him be, and when he's ready to have mm -hmm. a conversation, I, I let them do it. And man, there's been there's been a few man. There's been a couple people that reach out to me, direct messages. Man, I've I've seen you do this. I've seen your gratitude list. I've seen you talk about your sobriety openly, and it's really helped me so much. And and I truly, man, when I when I when I hear that, it, I don't take it for granted because I was the guy doing that to people. I remember, man, you really helped. Mm -hmm. You were the you know because you I was looking for people that were high profile or someone that did something like mm -hmm. I did to show me it could be done, you know? So I was like, it was kind of a superficial thing at first, but I really want, I want to see someone that mm -hmm. in this music game that's gotten sober and still does cool music and mm -hmm. still does the things and still has danger to them. Mm -hmm. And so, um, any opportunity I, you know, and I think there's, there's such a cool rock, attitude thing about the sobriety man it's like mm -hmm. you know people are like man you know what Jimi hendrix have done mm -hmm. the music he did if had he been sober i'm like i don't i know he would have been at the plant he'd have been at the he'd be off the bench mm -hmm. more he'd be playing he'd be mm -hmm. in the game more so maybe he would we never know you know mm -hmm. we only got the one version of him yeah a lot of times people think that oh this person got sober so their music's gonna suck yeah you know or, or they think that it's not the same because they're not on drugs or yeah now they're lame or whatever you know you know and, and i say it to you like this like so a lot of these people go through all those dark mm -hmm. alcoholism all that stuff when they're in the in the prime creative years of their life mm -hmm. so yeah i mean there's going to be you know during my 20 from 24 to 36 i was thriving creatively mm -hmm. my everything's firing off you're inspired you're angst you got mm -hmm. a lot of emotions i would just happen to be a drinking at that, mm -hmm. that period um you know when you get older naturally drinking or not your creativity kind of takes mm -hmm. a life gets in the way you have kids you don't have the same hunger mm -hmm. as you did so it's hard to tell is it age yeah, yeah. that just simply made you less <laughs> cool yeah <laughs> or is it the mm -hmm. you know i mean it, not using it's yeah. never you it's never usually like clean during my 20s and 30s and then i'd start partying <laughs> in my 50s <laughs> you know yeah. <laughs> maybe the music would get mm -hmm. good but i don't know i think there's like despair and mm -hmm. there's definitely undeniable things about being in that dark place and it opening your mind in weird mm -hmm. ways but it's not worth what you pay <laughs> yeah. to to explore those avenues, mm -hmm. you know. There's other ways to obtain it. Mm -hmm. I think. What um who was really there for you as like a pinnacle uh lighthouse for recovery when you were going through it, like in the music industry? Oh man. You know, it's it's kind of funny. So the guy Sonny, uh, that replaced me in Seven Dust, he was one of the first guys that I on my level that under my particular dynamic mm -hmm. that survived it. And it was like, Oh, that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. But, um, it was actually, you know, and this is under, I didn't realize this at the time, but I had a guitar tech. He worked for the other guitar player, but he's 
one of my best friends. Mm -hmm. Uh, he sponsored me in ways, but he was with us through the most, the darkest parts of seven dust. He was a guitar tech. He was sober. He was got sober when he was really young. Mm -hmm. And he was the guy, man, all those years that he had dealt with so many things, personal things at home and all these things. And was around the worst of the worst. I mean, he was around, you know, drinking and drugging until 7 a.m. He'd have to get up every day, and, mm -hmm. you know, go, as, as a crew member. So he, he was the guy that I actually really leaned on so many times as how do I do this? Like, and be happy. Mm -hmm. And how, he, he was the guy. So it wasn't like a, a high profile musician. It was, it was this, mm -hmm. like you had mentioned that the guy is just living his life and doing the program and doing his deal and, uh, and, and live and actually putting the action in. He was the guy and, uh, you know, his name's Brent and he's just an incredible guy. And I, we, we, we speak mm -hmm. all the time. He's starting a podcast soon. He said, man, ask, T you oh, know, ask awesome. Teddy was, mm -hmm. that's cool. That's <laughs> I need cool. to know about what kind of software yeah. to use. And yeah. I'll help anybody out. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of the same way. It's like, I love being vocal about my recovery cause I can. And like some people can't, or some people have kids that don't want their kids to know like their whole story or they yeah. work in a corporate setting. And it's like, like I was telling you, like, dude, I found out about getting, you know, clean through this book. Yeah. You know, Anthony Kiedis wrote this book, Scar Tissue. And it's like, dude, that might have saved me years of using. Absolutely. Because I, I no one, I was in an adolescent facility. Nobody brought an H&I meeting. Nobody was talking about the disease of addiction. Nobody was talking about 12 steps. Really? Stuff. It was an ad. I was the only person there on, on Suboxone and coming off crack. It was really just uh, like a psych ward for kids. So there, there was no, there was no need for addiction talk there. And when I got out of there, I read that book, and dude, he talked about everything you yeah. can think of. He talked about using. He talked about periods of abstinence. He talked about not being happy, even being clean. He talked about the program and why the program works. He talked about a sponsor, and then at the end of it, he talked about how everyone who everyone who knows who's clean long time does something on a consistent basis to not go back. And some people go to the jail. Some people do service at meetings. Some people do a lot of yoga or meditation or some people are into therapy. And he was like, you know, if you really want to do something, this is like what's going to sustain it. And if you want long lasting things, you're going to have to make a drastic change. And it really outlined, you know, the whole program. And then, dude, I closed that book. I went to a meeting. Yeah. And that was it. And it's yeah. like, I don't know if that would have happened. And like, there's people who'd listen to a podcast who were like, bro, I moved to Florida after the podcast and just went to a meeting and got clean that's great you know, man so, yeah, it's cool. yeah you're doing good work man and i appreciate you yeah i, I really mean it. I, I i feel so lucky that i that this has happened and any opportunity that i get to kind of talk about this mm -hmm. stuff man yeah like it like you man i'm open about it i mm -hmm. I, I don't really like the name exact you know programs mm -hmm, or anything mm -hmm. like that i just know um but when i do have an opportunity to talk mm -hmm. detail with someone i'll give them this is what I've done. Mm -hmm. This is this is the path that I chose, and um, yeah. So I love it, man. Uh, um, it's it's so important to me, and and, and these things always kind of tend to happen when I really need them the most. You mm -hmm. know, there'd be all kinds of dramatic stuff going <laughs> on in life, and then and things that just come back and center me into mm -hmm. to the foundation. How how meaningless ninety percent of this oh, these crazy. stressors are, man. Like, man, that's not worth mm -hmm. being upset about. Hey, I appreciate you. Thank you so much, yeah, man. man. Thanks, Clint.